I'm really excited about this conversation because it's so kind of unexpected for our audience. It's mm. going to be yes. a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's jump in. Um, so welcome to China Institute's Piece of, Pieces of China, an online series that tells the story of China one object at a time. I'm Dinda Elliott. And I'm honored to be joined today by Emile de Bruyne, who is a top expert on historic British houses at the National Trust, which promotes the preservation of and public access to buildings and gardens of historic and architectural interest in um, the United Kingdom. Um, Emile is the author of a beautiful book, which I have here called Chinese Wallpaper in Britain and Ireland, um, which came out, I guess, about a year ago, something like that. Uh, is that right, Emil? In 2017. 2017. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. Okay. Anyway, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, Aaron is going to post uh, a link to it so you can take, take a look at it. Um, and so, you know, he's been looking at the question of Chinese wallpaper for a very long time in the UK. So, so let's jump right in, Emil. So tell us, why are you so fascinated by Chinese wallpaper? Well, it's one of those, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Dinda, uh, for your kind words. It's one of those amazing aspects of um, British and Irish country houses that is kind of hiding in plain sight. Um, these, these things hang on the wall and, and often they've been ignored in the past, but actually they're amazingly um, produced, um, almost kind of work, works of art. Um, and because I'd looked in, I'd, I'd uh, been interested in Chinese and Japanese art for a long time. And when I started working for the National Trust, I found these, uh, saw these objects in these houses. And with the help of colleagues, gradually, I, I started to uh, research them. Great, fabulous. Let's take a look. You've got, uh, Emil is gonna kind of lead us through the conversation today, as opposed to the other way around. And I will jump in with questions, but he's got some beautiful images to share with us. So go ahead. Thank you, Dinda. Yes, here we are. Um, well, to start with, with this um, wallpaper at Felbrick Hall in Norfolk in England. And in the autumn of 1751, the owner of this house, uh, William Wyndham II, um, wrote in, in a letter, actually, he, he was kind of grumbling about the cost of getting a London paper hanger to come all the way to rural Norfolk uh, in order to install this Chinese wallpaper, because you needed specialists to handle this different paper, these large sheets, and of course, this panoramic scenery. And he mentioned at three shillings sixpence per diem while at Felbrick and sixpence per mile traveling charges. I think this is a cursed deal. So it's a wonderful example of a, a client worrying about, you know, the cost of a redecoration project. But well, it's also... There. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but it's also a great example of a precise date for the installation of a Chinese wallpaper, which is yeah. relatively rare, 1752. Yeah, and it's so fascinating to think about, you're talking about the journey it took from the port of, of London, I guess, to, uh, you know, Norfolk, but it had already made this very long journey all the way from, and you'll tell us about this, I guess, the workshops of Suzhou. So, wow. Yes, absolutely. It was a, it was a global product effectively. Um, but in this picture, we can we can see some of the skills of the paper hanger, for instance, on the left hand side where he's kind of uh, cut the the edge of that decorative rock in, in a sinuous way in order to make it seem like a natural fit for the central image. And along the bottom, he's added various fragments in, in with a sort of slate of hand to try and extend the wallpaper. So these were various tricks of the trade that these paper hangers had to engage in. Um, but equally, um, the, uh, the wallpaper is a wonderful example of Chinese symbolism of bird and flower imagery, for instance, the, the pheasants uh, representing beauty and the peonies um, symbolic of rank and uh, wealth. Mm. Here's a closer view of that wallpaper. And again, you can see along the bottom, various fragments added by uh, the paper hanger uh, of, of decorative rock. But also you can see an egret there and an egret uh, next to uh, lotus is symbolic of, of the virtuous 
government official, you know, who stays beautiful, pure and white, even though his his feet are in the in the mud of the of the pond, as it were. <laughs> and um, in this image, you can we can actually see that these wonderful wallpapers are not painted, but are actually printed. And often in the past, this wasn't realized because the printing is such high quality. For instance, the ducks look so kind of natural and, and fluidly depicted, but it was printed, uh, printed uh, woodblock printing, uh, and these blocks would be more than two meters in length. Uh, huge blocks. Um, and here, the telltale signs here, you can sometimes see little breaks in the in the lines representing the water, and that's a telltale sign of, uh, of printing. And sometimes in, in, the, in the, the black, you can also see that the black hasn't completely taken to the paper. That's another telltale sign. Uh, but my, my colleague, uh, Andrew Bush, uh, conservator, had to, you know, really show me these these particular signs. Um, so tell me a little bit about where this stuff came from. How did that come to be? What was happening in China? Well, um, we we um, I'll just go to the next slide. This um, while I talk, um, we think we we don't know for sure uh, because. Um, there's not a lot of documentation about uh, exactly where in China it came from, but we think the woodblock printed uh, wallpapers actually came from Suzhou because uh, in, in the Yangtze River Delta, because that was a, a an important um, center for uh, printing both printed books, but also illustrated books and prints is a wealthy and sophisticated city with a large market for uh, luxury objects uh, known for its prints. So we think these came from there. And it's really, um, uh, but at the time, uh, Europeans were still allowed to um, visit various different ports mm -hmm. in, in China. This is that room at um, Felbrick Hall, the, the, the bow window uh, dressing room where it was hung. If and could, just- If I could jump in for a second. Yes. It's, it's so fascinating that uh, you've described basically this, this wallpaper being made in Suzhou, say, um, and yet the Chinese were not using it as wallpaper. So it was kind of a concept which was being developed in Europe using Chinese designs. And these Europeans brought the concept to Suzhou and said, would you be willing to, can you figure out how to make this for us? Um, so that's quite fascinating in terms of the East-West trade. Yes, the Chinese were, were making prints and they were also making planar wallpapers for their own interiors. But the idea to, ha to combine the two and to have pictorial wallpapers was inspired by the demand in Europe. So that makes it Again, this interesting kind of global, mm -hmm. excuse me, global product. Yeah. And this painting here um, shows where the imagery actually came from because um, it actually has a really long tradition in uh, Chinese art, this bird and flower imagery. And um, we even have references to plants being used as symbols in the very early uh, Book of Songs, the Shijing, which is from the 12th to the 7th century uh, before the Common Era. And burn and flower images were appearing in art at least by the 10th century of the Common Era. Mm -hmm. And this is an example from, from the Ming Dynasty, uh, a court painter producing this for the Ming court. And you can see very much uh, similar to what, what was also shown in that wallpaper. The other thing that's fascinating to me is, I'll stop talking in a second, but um, you've talked about the fact that these artisans who were making this wallpaper, you know, they were not, it was the classical sort of Wenren, the classical literati and the classical painters were viewed as real artists. And yet these artisans who had incredible skills were really considered to be more of kind of lowly. Yes, exactly. Even the painting I just um, showed uh, beautifully, uh, uh, subtly depicted uh, scenery, uh, that would have been a relatively uh, considered like an, an artisan um, and uh, in, uh, because he wasn't like a gentleman painter. Oh, really? um, and this kind of representational, very detailed, very colorful uh, painting 
yes, did have a relatively low status. So that's a really interesting aspect of Chinese culture at the time. Some of these paintings did make it to Europe in this, from the 16th century onwards. And this is a wonderful example from about 1720 of Chinese hanging scroll paintings of bird and flower subjects being used to decorate walls in this uh, pavilion in uh, the Pagodenberg Pavilion in Munich. Um, so here you can see how the European taste for this kind of imagery was developing and Europeans were using uh, Chinese paintings and prints. This is an example of, um, of an English um, printer uh, using Chinese imagery to create a sort of chinoiserie imitation Chinese wallpaper. And of course, wallpaper was developing in, in Europe at that time, late 17th century. And here you can see how they were combining all sorts of vaguely Asian motifs together to create this uh, English wallpaper. Slightly later example, again, of an English wallpaper is this one, uh, hand painted this time uh, for a house um, in Gloucestershire. And um, again, inspired clearly by Chinese bird and flower imagery, but made by British artisans. So this taste was developing in Britain. And then around 1750 is when you suddenly see these printed Chinese wallpapers arriving in Europe, uh, probably in response to this, this taste, uh, but effectively it's a new product combining Chinese prints with uh, the European taste for wallpaper. So here we have the pheasants at Felbrigg Hall sitting on their picturesque rock. This is the kind of rock that you would see in elegant Chinese gardens used as a kind of uh, garden sculpture. Um, and You're describing it as a product, it almost seems blasphemy because this is such beautiful art. But in fact, it's fascinating to think of it as being, you know, this is a business essentially. Yes, absolutely. And it was a very, it was a luxury uh, mm -hmm. product. It mm -hmm. was, in a way, it was art. But of course, it also shows how our conceptions of art are different to, you know, uh, 17th century European or Chinese conceptions of art. So that makes it more interesting as well. Uh, but this was printed. So there were actually multiple copies of this wallpaper. And a few of them do survive elsewhere as well, apart from at Philbrick. So for instance, at Item Moat, you can see on the right, that's a house in Kent. Slightly different color because this wallpaper had a slightly different life, exposed to a little bit more damp, and it was overpainted later on with European paints. That's why it looks slightly different, but it's obviously the same print. Mm -hmm with this pheasant. And here, another pair of pheasants, uh, again at item moat, from this same set that's also at Felbrick Hall. And this particular one, if you then look at the next um, image uh, you, in this German uh, country house, Schloss Wörlitz in Anhalt Dessau, uh, it's exactly the same print once again. The, the colors are obviously different because this one has been slightly better preserved. But you can see the same pheasants on their decorative rock surrounded by uh, peonies. Um, so again, all these symbols together in this, this composition. And uh, on the one hand, quite realistic, but on the other hand, very much meant as a sort of symbolic ensemble. Mm -hmm. This one was installed slightly later, um, but the interesting thing um, is that these printed wallpapers spread throughout Europe after 1750 and the decades afterwards, um, right across Europe from Poland to Ireland and from Sweden to Italy, uh, very fashionable. Again, this is the same one the same print with the two pheasants surviving in Up Park in West Sussex. Um, and you can see how this um, sheet was actually combined on either side with, with other sheets to form this uh, panoramic uh, wall decoration. And this is the room where it would have originally have, have hung. There wouldn't, wouldn't have been these paintings here. Uh, this was the, um, the sitting room of the lady of the house, Lady Featherstone Hall. And there you can see a, a lacquer cabinet um, 
half Asian, half British um, hybrid cabaret, but that would have also been there at that time together with the wallpaper. Um, but then what happened after about 1760, these printed wallpapers get replaced with purely hand painted wallpapers. And initially this, this puzzled us why uh, why did the printed wallpapers disappear? It seems odd for us that something handmade replaces something partly printed. But what may be the reason for this is that in 1757, the um, Chenlong Emperor restricted all foreigners uh, to the port of Canton or Guangzhou uh, for, for various political and economic reasons that it was felt to be safer to uh, concentrate the, the, the foreign barbarians in uh, Guangzhou. Uh, so it may be that because of that, it was less economical to get the printed wallpapers from further north from, from Suzhou. So that therefore this trade petered out, but the painters in Guangzhou responded by uh, ramping up production of these fully hand painted wallpapers. So well, again, we can see- I mean, think, of, think of Canton as, you know, we know about the Canton system and I guess the Emperor Kangxi had been worrying about all these foreigners wandering around China and had started to set up this system in Canton, but then his grandson Qianlong really cracked down and imposed the, the restriction of trade to Canton. But what's fascinating to me is, you know, you always think of Canton in terms of big, you know, traded industrial goods, or whatever, and you don't think of there being crafts craft shops where there are painters who you were saying the painters are actually there. These magnificent artisans are actually in Canton creating these works. Yes, it would have been an, a niche market, a, a small market, part of the overall trade. Um, but yeah, apparently um, that, that flourished as well. And, and here again, the, uh, the beautiful white egret um, traipsing through the mud of the pond. Um, and this, uh, this wallpaper, essentially the same, but in a different colorway, as we might call it now, also survived at uh, Nostal Priory. Originally, it was, would have been off-white, slightly lighter, uh, but the same, exactly the same scenes as in the earthic wallpaper I just showed. And here it was incidentally supplied by uh, Thomas Chippendale's firm. So they supplied both the furniture and the, the Chinese wallpaper, which they must have um, sourced in, in London. Um, and the, we, we then see at the end of the 18th century that the Chinese uh, painting workshops keep innovating. They keep adding elements to the wallpapers. For instance, they added the depiction of uh, jardiniers, like you can see in, in this wallpaper from Penryn Castle in uh, Wales. And they added things like um, balustrades and bird cages, and these were all elements which indicated uh, that that this that we're looking at elegant uh, Chinese gardens. You know, they're the kind of accoutrements of of Chinese gardens, just like the picturesque rocks. And um, here so is another example. Time, so we need to need to move. Let's. It, I wonder if we right. can get to the sort of current, you know, yes. more current stuff. Indeed. Bamboo also appeared in the 19th century. And here's another example of a beautiful wallpaper with rhythmical um, bamboo from the 19th century. And then uh, indeed, it does um, move into the 20th century as well, because um, Chinese wallpapers became antiques uh, effectively from the end of the 19th century onwards. And they were bought and sold as antiques, moved between houses, moved from Europe, for instance, to America as well, uh, like this one, which was hung in the penthouse of the uh, media tycoon Condé Nast uh, in uh, Park Avenue, New York in 1924. And um, this has continued effectively throughout the 20th century. They have uh, remained popular and become a sort of mixture of uh, Chinese heritage and with an added sort of European country house uh, cachet as well. So it's become a really interesting sort of composite cultural 
uh, product. And uh, what I love to, about this is that it really sort of traces the story of East West trade, right? You, you've, the, the early pieces are, you know, reflections of the very earliest, um, China's very earliest trade with the West. Of course, they had been trading, you know, earlier than that, but, but it was a manifestation of that. And then bringing it up to the modern day, of course, you've got, you know, de Gournay, who uh, the founder of de Gournay basically took a piece of this antique wallpaper to China, uh, you know, I don't know if it was 20 years ago or so, and said, can you copy this? Can you, can you make this again? And so that was the beginnings of the, you know, one of the leading contemporary um, producers of, of Chinese wallpaper. Exactly. And, and this wallpaper uh, shown here was, was handled by the New York firm of, of Gracie and, and they bought it from Condé Nast's apartment. And it, Fragments of it still survive currently in the apartment of decorator Michael S. Smith in New York. So this wallpaper still exists in, in part. And Gracie, again, have made uh, facsimiles of it. So this product product is kind of reincarnating itself, just like you're, so you're saying. Yeah, it's so fascinating. The idea is, as you were saying the other day, that it sort of began, the imagery, of course, began in China, came to Europe. Then the Europeans said, well, we really like this imagery. Now we want to actually create wallpaper. So then they took it back to China, got the fantastic artisans in Suzhou to make it, came back to Europe. And then in its current iteration, once again, the Westerners took the stuff back to China and said, can you, can you make it? And now it's being you know, made for a Western audience again. So it's fascinating. I wonder as a final question, do you think that China has been influenced at all by this by this uh, work, and are there is there Chinese wallpaper in Chinese homes today, or is it um, you know really something that is only in the West? No, there is indeed, and and these companies like De Gournay and Gracie um, are selling newly made uh, handmade wallpapers to Chinese clients as well, and obviously they partly appreciate it for. Uh, the Chinese heritage that this represents, but equally it's now acquired a kind of international heritage um, chic as well, if you like. So it's become more than just Chinese. And of course, as we've been saying, it, it started out already uh, at its infancy. It was already a hybrid thing, uh, Eastern Western product. And it's, it's continued like that. And it, it still is that today. And that's, I think, part of its appeal. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, unfortunately, our time is up, but I want to thank Emile de Bruyne so much for giving us this bite-sized, it's way too fast, we need to talk much more, a bite-sized take on fascinating designs and history of trade between China and the West. Um, we hope so much to bring you back um, next time, hopefully in person. And, um, and I want to thank you all for tuning in. Uh, please check out our other Pieces of China episodes on YouTube. We're creating a very fun mosaic of China through these stories. And I want to encourage you all to please become members of China Institute. Um, your support helps us bring brilliant speakers like and unexpected speakers like Emile de Bruyne um, to you and our broad array of programs. Uh, also follow the National Trust, which I understand is celebrating its 125th anniversary this year. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, the next few pieces of China are going to be very fun as well. Um, next week, we have Peggy Wong, who's an art historian, talking about Wang Guangyi's political pop work and challenging the way we look at Chinese art. So please tune in again. Emil, I want to thank you so much for helping us to tell the story of China. And we Thanks very much for having me, Dinda. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye, everybody.